afternoon to our friends in the talent development profession. My name is Lawrence Ko and welcome to another Upland Hope Learn From Home webinar brought to you by the Philippine Society for Talent Development. We are actually entering our fourth month of delivering free learning sessions with expert speakers all around the globe. And the theme for this afternoon session is capability and capacity building for the new normal. We are now live via Zoom and Facebook through our page www.facebook slash mypstd. Live recording of our previous Learn From Home sessions are also uploaded there, so feel free to view them at your leisure. And of course, like and share the learnings to your fellow talent development colleagues. So I'm going to see that we're now at 124 participants in our Zoom room and a couple of more people in Facebook, watching our Facebook live. I'll be opening the chat and then I'm going to see some of the and read some of the comments from the chat. I have here Dr. Philip Punzalan. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to you too. From Vanessa Espejon. Good afternoon from SJDM Bulacan. So we have our reach not only within Metro Manila but also to the other provinces of the Philippines. Once again, welcome and good afternoon to everyone. Let me now go to our demographics check. So for us to better understand the composition of our audience today, Nat Monsera, our uh, professional team, a member of our professional team, will help us launch the demographics Zoom poll for the day. And we actually have three questions for this afternoon. The first time would be, uh, the first one would be, is this your first time in PSTD? Learn from home series. So I think this is this should be the third question. The first question, rather, is what is your current profession or current role in talent development? Please answer through the poll. Alternatively, you can also go to the chat. Our second question is where are you calling from? And our third question is that is this your first time in attending the PSTD Learn from Home series? And the speakers, I'm pretty sure, are very excited to know more about you this afternoon. So please, please answer the demo graphics. I'm seeing here Lian is coming from Angeles City. Wow. And then we also have Rowena coming in from Makati and Jessalyn from Valenzuela. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Nat. And let me now share to you the results of our poll. So majority of our participants this afternoon are educators. So they can be secondary or tertiary teachers. And then coming in close would be human resources, admin, managers, and executives in the talent development profession. We are more or less pretty evenly distributed. We also have 12% soft skills trainer and 11% technical skills trainer and our speakers will surely have things to share with you that will further enhance our skills and talent development. Where are you calling from? That's question number two. An overwhelming majority is coming from Luzon. That's around 88% and then almost equal with Visayas and Mindanao at 7% and 5% respectively. The next question is, is this your first time in PSTD Learn From Home series? <laughs> or again, a majority, 84% would be what we would call repeat customers or in this particular situation, repeat learners. So again, welcome. All right. So now we're currently at 179 participants via Zoom. And while we wait for the rest of the participants to come filing in, I would like to invite everyone to join the society as a member and actively contribute to our vision of continually developing the workplace learning and performance impro improvement profession in the country. So I know that you've been attending a lot of PSTD webinars and there's actually an opportunity for you to be at the forefront of this particular vision. Let me start with the first one. You can either join us as an individual or corporate member and receive benefits valued at almost twice as your membership contribution for the year. Some of them include free attendance to our monthly ET panels. That's what we call our general membership meetings that of course happens monthly. Corporate members are entitled to send two free delegates per month 
and individual members can also attend two of our paid webinars for free throughout the year. And that goes to five if you are a corporate member. You can see there on the lower left, you will also get access to both our community of practice and very, very rich L&D resources. More details can be found on our website. Just type in www.pstd.org. Or alternatively, you can also scan the QR code that you're seeing on your screen. It will take you directly to our website. All right. I'm going to greet a few of our participants in the chat for a minute. So I'm seeing here a couple of people from Cebu. Hello and welcome, Celestino Haban. Angelis Kalipay, good afternoon to you too. And then to the rest of our learners. Wow, so we're currently at 218. Okay, so at this point, we're now at a couple of people watching our Facebook Live. And with that, I would now gladly introduce you to our moderator for this afternoon. She's the Management and Leadership Development Programs Director of Land Bank of the Philippines and a sitting trustee of the board and the secretary of the Philippine Society for Talent Development. She is also my colleague in Toastmasters as she is serving as Area Director for Division L of Toastmasters in the Philippines. So please, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to this afternoon's Learn From Home moderator, Ms. Kina Torres Rojas. Good afternoon, Kina. Good afternoon, Lawrence. Thank you very much to my fellow Toastmaster. Good afternoon to all our attendees this afternoon. We have a whooping 234 participants in our Zoom room. And for those of you who were not able to register and join us through Zoom, we have already 56 viewers through our FB Live. And just a few reminders to our dear participants so that we'll be having a very smooth afternoon. We would like to request all attendees to kindly mute yourselves to manage the flow of information. Our technical person, Nat, will be muting everyone throughout the whole duration. And we would like you to make use of the Q&A tab found at the bottom part of your Zoom screen for questions to any of our speakers for this afternoon. Kindly type in your questions through the Q&A tab. And yes, we also have the chat tab for your comments, annotations, or even greetings that you would like to share with us. Kindly use the chat tab. It is located beside the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom application. And we would like to request everyone to kindly change your configuration for the chat tab to send to all panelists and attendees. I am very sure that all of our attendees would love to know your insights on this afternoon's webinar. For those of you who might be asking, how are we going to get the e-certificates for our attendance to this webinar. PSTD will be issuing the certificates to those who will answer the post-evaluation forms, which shall be sent to you via email after this webinar. So the post-evaluation forms will only be sent to those who log in here in Zoom and stayed for at least 40 minutes. So that's all for our reminders. It's now time for us to meet our speakers this afternoon. Leading the pack is Ezenam Adarkor from Ghana, an industry agnostic product manager who has worked across multiple industries such as telecommunications, utility management, and education management. Essie has a solid experience in four different countries over her six year career. Our first speaker's products impact people in emerging markets the most. An ideology that has seen her move from Vodafone to B-Box and now to ALX, The Room. Currently translating her skills in innovation 
customer obsession, and stakeholders management into building a digital version of the Leadership Accelerator, a training program aimed at turning mid-career professionals into visionary leaders run by the African Leadership Group. When not working, Essie loves to be an active participant in the game nights organized by her three brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, Essie Nam Adorkor, our first speaker. Hi, Essie. And Hi, yes, guys. to join Essie is coming all the way from Ireland is Andrew O'Regan. Andrew is the user experience lead for ALX, has worked in design for around 15 years, having started in marketing and advertising at a number of agencies and in-house in Manchester, London, and Melbourne. Most recently, he has moved over to the product and user experience design, working at the Royal Shakespeare Company, Studio Canal, and Ovo Energy. Andrew, when not fighting the good fight that UX does not equal digital, you can find him growing vegetables, listening to music from around the world, and yes, trying to perfect a chili recipe. Wow, a chef indeed. Andrew, welcome to PSTV. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andrew. And to complete Hi, our speakers for this afternoon, coming all the way from Mauritius is Kavi Ramburn. Kavi joined ALX over a year ago as a product manager. During his time with ALX, he has worked on three main programs. First, being the data science launchpad a 15-week full-time, highly intensive blended learning program to train recent university graduates into entry-level data scientists. Second, the Data Scientist Accelerator, or the DSXL. It is a four-month part-time blended learning program for non-technical managers and executives, perhaps like us. And lastly, in light of the pandemic, Kavi has worked on the digital transition of ALX programs, focusing on one of the organization's core leadership offerings. Prior to joining ALX, Kavi worked in the nonprofit sector in seven different countries, mostly with educational NGOs and an anti-human trafficking organization. During his free time, Kavi thoroughly enjoys playing football and beach ball volleyball and beach volleyball. He also enjoys hiking, baking, making smoothies, and watching French comedy. Ladies and gentlemen, to complete our lineup of speakers for this afternoon, Kavi Ramburn. Hi, everyone. And now I would like to turn you over to our first speaker, Andrew. Take it away. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you, Kina. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. So, yeah, so um, thank you, uh, everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew, um, as stated previously, um, and I'm the user experience lead at, um, at um, ALX, or The Room, as um, as we're now rebranding it. So we want, I want to introduce today to talk about um, like just-in-time learning or what the African leadership uh, pedagogy is. So just to start off, um, I'd like to ask everybody to, um, you should see um, a link in the chat window, in the Q&A window. Um, and I'd just like to ask you what single words describe your approach to teaching and learning? Like what are your, what are your learning principles? Um, so, um, if you can share that in the chat window, Kina, has that been shared? Yes, and if I may share my screen, we would like to request our participants to kindly go to www.menti.com or if you are using your mobile phones, just download the Mentimeter app and type in the code 314664. Our question for this afternoon is, what words describe your approach to teaching and learning? Uh, 
I can see that some of our participants are typing in their answers through the chat box. There is self-discovery, experiential, interactive, innovative, engaging, learning. And so far, 11 are already answering uh, through our Mentimeter. 29 participants. Interactive, I think the main one here on Mentimeter. That's great. Yeah. Yes, engaging, and engaging. Yeah, empowerment, okay. That's great, okay. Uh, okay, I can start okay. um, sharing again. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Everybody for uh, for contributing. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the African Leadership Group and what we do. So our mission is to create three million ethical entrepreneurial leaders um, across Africa. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years, um, starting off with the African Leadership Academy, which is um, pre-university learning for, um, for, uh, for students, and that's been going since 2008, uh, so there's been a number of alumni since then. We've since then opened up the African Leadership U University, um, which is in Mauritius and then Rwanda, and that's been going since 2013, and we've had a number of classes graduate from there. And then much more recently, we've had um, ALX. Um, uh, that's where myself, uh, Kavi, and Essie are based. Um, so that has the Launchpad program, which is aimed at um, post-university um, post uh, participants, and also Accelerator, which is aimed at people who are in middle management um, during their working career to give them that extra, extra boost. So pre-COVID, that was based in Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria. Uh, since 2018, uh, but as Kavi and Nessie would explain, we're moving to um, a, an online model now with that, so we're not based in any particular country anymore. So the reason I asked you about your own learning principles is because we have some pretty um, solid ones that are based on based on lots of um, science and, um, and, and learning over time um, that we use th throughout all of our programs at the African Leadership Group. And it's based on what we call a, um, ASHIP, which is active, social, holistic, personal, and integrated. Um, so I'm just going to walk you very quickly, walk you through those now. So active, we believe that um, learning is an active process um, of acquiring, storing, and applying um, knowledge and skills. So we, we achieve this through practice and retrieving knowledge over time, so continually reinforcing something that uh, our participants have learned. Uh, elaboration, so building on a concept that you introduce to, to your participants. Um, Multisensory, and that something needs to be, um, re again, reinforced, but from a number of different mediums and angles. Um, and one of the most important things is about like our facilitators or our teachers, they're guides, they're not sages, and they're not, they're not people there who are the fount of all knowledge. Um, we, we see examples of this in our, accelerator, in our accelerator program, where throughout the course of our, um, of, of our intensives, um, we, we, we practice what we call diverge and converge. So you, you start off at a certain point, the participants then diverge to find out um, to find out and discover more themselves, and then we converge back together again to, um, to share the learning. And the facilitators are asking questions throughout to help guide that learning um, as, as they go along. So next up we have uh, holistic. So learning, like, learning is not limited to, it's not limited to intellectual concepts or cognitive skills. Social and emotion skills also need to be learned. So we're very much um, we're very much aimed at like educating educating a whole person, not just certain aspects of the brain. So we believe that everything has to develop at the same at the same time. So our participants they learn how to transfer skills and habits across different contexts to deepen learning. So under, understanding and knowing how to actually kind of transfer what they've learned elsewhere. Um, and one of the um, one of the main things here is um, missions, not majors. So. We have, um, so this is particularly from African Leadership University where yes, you will have a major, you know, such as engineering or social science or something like that, but it's not about that. It's like, that, that is helpful, but what it's about is like, what does the actual student want to do? What, what, what do they want to do with their life? Uh, I think I've actually accidentally skipped a um, slide here. But, um, but yeah, uh, you can see an example of this in, in our Launchpad program, which I mentioned. So there are, well, there is the initial leadership Launchpad. We also have a data science version of it and a conservation version of it. 
And while they are, they do have flavors of those particular topics in them, it's all about like, you know, building leaders and building, building next generation of African leader, leaders. Um, so the next aspect uh, is social. So social interactions can incentivize learning and provide context for the development of skills and knowledge and can reinforce active learning mechanisms. Um, so that, that's what I talked about um, previously in the active part. So peer learning is a primary mechanism for, a social, for a social learning. So we, we believe that the best way for somebody to, to actually kind of learn something and to know they've learned something is it by explaining it to something else, uh, explaining it to somebody else. So that's when you get a real handle on, on what you're actually trying to learn. And then social context um, for, sharing, uh, for sharing and collective learning. So again, bringing people, to get, bringing people together to kind of discuss what they've learned and to kind of um, explain to each other how things work. So you see that in place in our Launchpad program as well. So we have, uh, we have mainly group projects and, uh, and peer groups that last throughout the course of the program. And we also have kind of um, a scattered throughout the, the program as well. We have hackathons where people get together to work on problems that are kind of novel to them and they work through them together and they, they, they share their learning. So the next, um, next concept is integrated. Um, so um, enduring learning, it requires integration with diverse real world contexts. Uh, creating opportunities for application and an ability to learn from these complexities um, in these contexts. So very much aimed towards like real world applications and milestones. So uh, finding out how to actually apply what you're doing, what, what, what you're learning in a, in, in a real world uh, context, and also kind of figuring out what are the points along the journey that you know that you've actually developed a little bit. Um, so the focus here is on it's on methods and problem solving skills instead of content and disciplinary expertise. So again, it's all about like that um, cross um, being able to switch across context using skills that you've learned in a, in a number of different in a number of different places. So uh, one of the um, ways that we can see this in action is in our accelerator program, where there is a capstone project at the end of the at the end of the program. And this directly relates back to our participant. Like, so as I said, the, the participants in Exceler are more than like the middle, uh, mid-level managers or people who are mid midweight in their career. And their capstone project relates directly back to what they're doing at work. So they'll find a way through from what they learned in Accelerator to, um, to, to give that extra bit of value add in their, in their work context. So the last, um, the last part of our um, of our part of our principles is uh, uh, personal. So students or participants should be empowered to learn at their own pace and to curate learning around the key areas that they're passionate about. So um, it's very it's very much built. It's building towards self direction, like making sure that um, our participants actually feel that they can they can direct and figure out where they want to go themselves. Um, they want to, we want to align, uh, align the learning to missions and purpose. So again, going back to that missions not, uh, missions not majors idea. So like basically you, you, ch you change your learning to, 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 um, to, to go where you want to go. And then a key part of this is focusing on low stakes and transparent forms of feedback. So um, at this, um, so we, what we want, we don't want like big bang feedback, um, which can be quite, um, can be a bit traumatic for learners. What we want is something that kind of happens very regularly and, and with short, short periods of time in between. So something like once a week where you're constantly discussing and getting, getting a critique on your work. So it's not such a, it's not such a, um, a, tra a traumatic thing. And so um, what we, uh, we see this personal um, aspect in our, in our, um, modules is in um is in launchpad where we have post session challenges which are very very personal so we're asking asking our participants to take what you take what they're particularly interested from the course of a from, from the course of, a, of an intensive and then discover that more about themselves and it enhances the learning experience through that way getting people to learn more from themselves so uh, how that all this ties together is in the discovery learning cycle. So um, this this is a very this is how we see um, learning actually really um, hap happening and, and taking effect. So you discover, so you realize what you don't know and what you need to learn. Secondly, it's something uh, individual, so you're learning at your own pace and in your own way. And uh, third is uh, peer learning, so you learn it from others who've learned it and can explain it back to you. Uh, and then uh, facilitated group learning, so applying and um, extending your learning over other contexts to wider problems. And then it goes back again to discover. So once, once, you, once you know something, you know how much you actually don't know. So that's, that's where it fits into the cycle. 
So I'd just like to ask everybody in the uh, Q&A, so if we go back to like the, the main concept here is about um, missions, not majors, um, about how they, you should be involved about your purpose in life. So I'd, I'd like to ask everybody who's on the call at the moment. So what is your mission? Um, what is your mission? What, what are the things that you want to uh, want to do, either, either in per person or professional life? So if you want to um, add into the Q&A window and we can, um, we can pick out and discuss one or two of those. We would appreciate our 344 Zoom participants uh, if you can share with us through the chat box your, your answer as to what is your mission. Cool, we've got one here which is um, teach okay. one student at a time. Yeah, create development opportunities for every member of our community I like that. Building a competent workforce. Try to and also imparting knowledge, Andrew. Yeah, and I do. yeah. I'm liking these a lot. Inspire others. I love, yeah, I love that. Great. And Lisa Gobiankan said that her mission is to create and develop programs to help employees reach their full potentials at work. Would you agree with with this, Andrew? And Definitely. I mean, it, it, I mean, yeah, when I started the African Leadership Group, I didn't, you know, I wouldn't have been able to formulate a mission as quickly as a lot of our participants <laughs> have here. So very impressive. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you guys have thought about this before. OK, that's um, I think that's it for me. So I will pass over to SNM. All right. Um, greetings from Ghana and Accra. Um, my name is Esnam. Again, everyone calls me Essie, uh, just to, to make life simple for everybody and, and speaking to you from my home office, which is also my bedroom. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to kind of walk you through what we've been doing at ALX um, while we've been trying to take our programs online and, and build more um, blended learning for our participants. So um, this is what the Leadership Accelerator is um, about. And we are focused on building capacity in, in middle managers so that as they move into leadership roles, they can get all the best um, experience and the best learning um, and then use that to develop their own teams and become more purpose-driven leaders. So our aim is to, like, like Andrew said earlier, to create ethical and entrepreneurial leaders. And we think this starts from these middle managers who are leading their teams for the first time of, or very uh, for the first time in their careers and have no idea um, how to do this. So our program um, pre-COVID, um, our program was um, a six month program where you'd come in person for two days every month and we'd have full day sessions with uh, our participants and go through specific topics and specific themes. So here I've shown the themes that we cover in our program. We cover self-leadership, um, how to manage your, um, yourself and your time and your energy and to become your best self because if you lead yourself well, then you can lead your team well. So we go through self-leadership and we talk about commercial leadership as well, because as, as middle managers, you have to, you're responsible for uh, budgeting, you're responsible for P&L. So we want managers to be comfortable dealing with numbers, to be comfortable dealing with how they add value to the organization. Then we talk about people leadership and how to lead your team to become better versions of, this, of themselves and also to leave a version of yourself behind because the best leaders are not those who lead but also create other leaders and then the last thing we talk about is strategic leadership because you have to be able to see your team um, in the day-to-day -day, the stuff that they do and then also on a higher level how they bring uh, value to the organization overall and which direction they should be going to bring more value to to the organization so our program is is structured around these main themes and we like i said we before covid we were very focused on you do some challenges in between sessions so some of those post session challenges that andrew talked about that um bring out the learning that you've had while we've been in session where you you go through the whole discovery um 
understanding learning cycle in the classroom. So we have discovery in class and then application out of the classroom, which was what our whole ethos of blended learning was about. But um, post COVID, we had to, to take accelerator, the leadership accelerator online. And obviously there, there are some reasons why we have to do that. It's, it's, it's not, it wasn't our first choice, but we had to think about our participants. We didn't want to um, put our participants at risk of getting sick while they travel to our sessions. And we wanted to also take advantage of the fact that we've got people across the world. We have um, cohorts in South Africa, cohorts in Kenya, cohorts in Nigeria. And we actually felt that they would benefit from being all together in the same, in the same class um, and sharing their own different experiences. So that was actually a benefit of, of moving on mostly online. Um, and for us, continuity was important. These guys were already in, in the cycle. They needed to be able to keep up with the, the work that they were doing, the learning that was going on. It doesn't benefit from, from taking a long break in between. So yeah, so we, we actually decided very early, we have to go online. But on to the next, um, the next slide, I'm going to ask a, a question. You guys can put, put your answers in the chat. What, what are the biggest challenges that you faced with online teaching and learning? And you, I can bet you that we've also faced the exact same challenges. Can you, we, let's take about two minutes and you put some, some of your thoughts in the chat box. If I may read oh, I some of the, of the comments here, yes. <laughs> online connection. You know, Essie, here in the Philippines, free internet connection is really an issue. And even yeah. if you are paying for internet connection, it's really a problem. And also, mm -hmm. there's the gadgets, the platform. Right. And also accessibility of devices for participants. Mm. That is a that's, major problem. Wow, that's something I don't think we've particularly faced, but I think we, we, we'll, I will kind of touch on it a little bit when we talk about our journey as well. I think definitely the, the challenge of internet connection is one that we faced very, 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 very hardly in the, in the program. And, and I'll, I'll also pick on, on how we, we've dealt with that as well. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all your, um, all your inputs. So this is, this is how we are transforming. And this is not to say that this is the only way you can transform, but this is how we've done it. And some of the challenges that we faced um, while doing this is, um, is what I'm going to kind of lean into right now. So we're transforming by leaning into the medium. Yes, internet technology is not is not a fun experience we are realizing very quickly not a lot of people have the understanding that we thought not a, lo a lot of people have the connection that we thought and not a lot of people have the gadgets like in your case that we we thought they had so we we while we have all of these challenges we also have to design around those challenges but there are also benefits of being online, which like some of which I've already talked about, like the fact that we have a global cohort and they can learn from other people. So how can we make sure that those benefits come out um, while lessening the impacts of those disadvantages? We also focus on why we're doing the course. So a lot of the time there's that, oh, we wanna do everything, we want to teach everything, and we want to do everything that we were doing while we are in person. But if you really focus on why? Why was this um, an activity? Why was this the main reason why? We, why was this the, the, the activity placed in this session? Then you can actually come out with, with an activity that doesn't necessarily, it's not the same, but actually fits the same purpose. Another thing we've been doing is learning from others. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough that, that we are all very new to this. Everything is new for us. And so it's, there's a lot of um, benefits from learning from what others are doing and figuring out how that will translate into our own um, system. So I asked for challenges. And like I said, you can bet that we faced very, very similar challenges. When I talk about leaning into the medium, I think the first thing that um, most of us um, realized very early on is that you can't take what you were doing in person 
and do it online. It just doesn't work. We, we used to have um, eight hour sessions in person and it's like, you can't expect people to sit online for eight hours. Um, people are going to have their children coming in. People are going to have phones ringing, bosses calling. It, it, you can't have the exact same experience. So what, what we have done is keeping the overall goal in mind. Why are we doing these activities? What is the purpose of having people um, sit in a room and reflect on a specific um, topic and then rethink that activity? Does that activity actually have to happen while everybody is online? Ask yourself, can this happen before or after the session? Can this be done in a slightly different way? Can you make this learning a little bit different so that um, people can get a, a better understanding of it. So I'll give you a typical example. We, we used to have in-person coaching sessions um, with our, our participants. So they would get to coach a young leader in our, in our um, space. But now we don't have spaces and we, we are not in the same uh, place anymore. We can't have um, mid-level career managers uh, talking to, to entry-level people anymore. Um, because, of course, there's the internet uh, factor, there's the, the time factor. So we said, why don't they coach themselves in their session instead? So we, we changed the whole way that our coaching, um, our coaching session actually goes. Because we just started thinking, actually, this might make a, list, a lot more sense. Then learners aren't used to online. We are not used to online. Learners and facilitators are all not used to online. Um, we, we are used to going into the classroom and sitting behind like somebody lecturing or somebody showing you something and you picking up that, that information. But actually, the more opportunities you provide for learning for the participants, the better you get at actually delivering that online session. So for us, for every session, for every intensive we have, we have three sessions now instead of just two. And the first session is just like the recap session. And if you can miss the recap session if you want. So we have the recap session three, uh, three days before the main session. And what, what that means is people come in, they get more used to the, the, the medium that we are using. They test out some of the, the cues that we use in session as well. They learn how to use the chat box. They learn how to use the, the tick or the, the red cross, all of that, just so that they get a little bit more comfortable with the medium that we're using. And the facilitators also get comfortable with speaking to a screen and not a group of, of live um, uh, participants. Um, we also had our own assumptions about what works well and what doesn't work well. Obviously, if you've done this for a long time in person, you, you have an idea of why does this work and why does this doesn't work. And our own assumptions actually sometimes stand in the way of us coming out with good learning experiences, especially as we move to the online medium. So for us, we've taken to testing our own assumptions. If there's something that we think won't work, we need to understand why it won't work. So we will test it and we will try to make um, sense of why it didn't work. And actually, I'll leave that for Kavi to talk about. Kavi actually goes a lot more in depth about how we do testing and experimentation in our sessions. Now, while we are focusing on the, the learning outcomes, I think one of our biggest challenges in the classroom is what, because you have the time, you can add more stuff, you can add more um, juice to the source, if you will, like, oh yeah, yeah, so we're talking about uh, managerial leverage, but also we can talk about your, your time management and we can talk about all the other things because we are in person and you can actually gauge um, what's happening with uh, the part participants. But because you are online, you have to be very, very focused. So for us, what we've done is actually before every session design, we actually list out what do we want participants to learn? And we've been very ruthless about cutting that down. So um, the rule of thumb here is at most three learning outcomes um, per session and um, at most two uh, an activity per hour of the session. So if the session is two hours long, we want only two activities and those activities might, must actually cover the learning outcomes. So we have, it, it allows us to actually pair back and really focus on the real reasons why we are asking people to come into the classroom and come and study something. Um, 
I talk about limited resources. Um, it's not just the time. So you can ask people to come and sit online for four hours if you want, and people will come, but there is that focus factor. A lot of people cannot sit behind their screens and focus on someone teaching them or a learning activity for a long period. I think we realized that our sweet spot is somewhere between two and three hours. And after that, you just lose everybody. And um, there's no focus, there's no engagement. People are just like, um, we are just here for being here sake. And that's not the kind of experience that you want because our learning is very experiential. It's very focused on you discovering what you, you are getting out of it. Um, we need people to be very engaged throughout the session. So we focus on the big things um, that need to come out. We focus on the big activities that give us bang for buck. So if it's one big activity, for example, last time we had, um, we had people doing like a, a workshopping session. If that is the big activity that is going to bring out the most learning, then we spend all our time um, focused on that and do a debrief afterwards instead of trying to fit in like six different activities that would at attack each learning outcome separately. Great. Now for um, for uh, uh, learning from others, and this is where some of those challenges about technology, about internet connectivity, all those things come in. It's new for everybody and for us, it's an opportunity to learn and, and to teach other people. So while you, you realize, for example, we realized that um, some of our participants are having issues with connectivity, what we did was we started recording our sessions and sharing the recordings afterwards. So that if you had poor connectivity, that was a learning for us. People have poor connectivity. Let's actually give them the sessions afterwards. And one of our assumptions was if we give them the sessions afterwards, they won't come to class anymore because they know they're going to get the sessions. But actually that meant more and more people were coming because they didn't want to miss all the interactions that they felt they were missing in class. So this is, these are all some of the things that we were learning and, and learning from the participants actually, not from anyone else. Another challenge we've had is that our way is fairly unique. You saw our learning principles and, and the, the structure that usually guides our learning. We feel, we've, we've come to that over a long period of also learning and testing and experimenting. And so we felt our way is very unique. We don't know who else is doing this, but actually we can pick stuff from different people and, and add. And so we have this um, Slack channel internally where Anybody who found an interesting article, an interesting um, way of doing things would put it in the channel and we'd all read and say, okay, how could we um, um, add this to our learning experiences? How could we put this in so that somebody else um, uh, can use this in, in a different, in slightly different way? Also, we did a lot of cross-pollination. So while we were doing Excel moving online, there were some other programs that we were designing on the side and we were also testing some of our assumptions on those um, programs as well. So what's, what's that learning that we can learn from that side and put it into, into this session? So for example, uh, on one hand, we were designing a program for a specific client and we realized that if we did, um, if we gave all instructions to our participants at the same time, it didn't go well on that side. So we actually then, moved to giving scaffold um, instructions and actually took that um, learning and put it into the Excel online program. And that made a very big difference in our sessions because participants were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You, I now get all the instructions of what I'm supposed to do. So that was great. And then the last thing I want to talk about is that you have, we have limited time. People are moving so quickly, the world is moving so quickly, it's changing so quickly. So you have to move very quickly in a, in, to catch up with your learners, to catch up with, with everything that's going on with them. So for us, what we are doing is, um, and Kavi will talk a little bit more on this, is that we are learning as quickly as we can from the sessions that we are building. So we are learning what works and what doesn't work very, very quickly. If, if we try something today and it, it doesn't look like it's going, to, it's going to be a positive experience, we drop it immediately. And we are using data to make those changes. So after every session, we have um, an evaluation form that people fill out and we use that data to say, okay, so this is something that we should continue doing. This is something that we should stop because that is the feedback that we are 
we're getting from our students. So really, it's, this, this whole experience is not just about, it's not about what do you already know? I think that's something that, that's an ethos that the AL group is really good at. It's not about, we have all the answers, it's about what don't we know? Who can we learn from and how quickly can we learn it? Great, I think I'll hand over to Kavi now. But yeah, I'm open for questions as well. Awesome, thank you, Essie. Um, I'll actually take over and pick up um, from Essie's last point, uh, which, is, which was around testing. So that's going to be my focus for, for the next uh, 10 minutes. I'll talk about how us within the AL group, uh, we've uh, gone about testing and iterating uh, with our programs. And, and the key thing I want to focus on and I want um, our listeners here today to, uh, to keep in mind is that this feedback process that we've implemented uh, in our different programs uh, is continuous. So at no point do we stop testing, at no point do we stop learning, at no point do we stop improving. So as you'll see, I'll talk about um, how we do testing um, and iteration in the design process and also testing and iteration in the delivery of our program. So as you'll see, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous cycle that, that we try to uh, implement. So let me start with um, testing and, it, in, and iteration in the design process. So focusing on uh, the Excel online program that Tessie was talking about, one of the first things that we had to do um, was to develop the, the new session plans um, for an online setting. So we had to come up in that first phase, uh, developing those, those initial drafts. So drafting our new learning outcomes, doing research about new ways to, um, to actually facilitate and deliver programs uh, in a virtual setting and setting up a new structure that was very different from um, our facilitator guides from an in-person setting. So that was our first step. We then took those initial uh, drafts of our session plans, brought those to our internal team, so our internal product team that has um, uh, people from the data science side that have um, um, experienced designers like Andrew. So from a whole uh, range of different uh, uh, experiences and backgrounds, so getting the feedback from, uh, from our team and then going back and incorporating that feedback on our initial draft. Once we've done that, we then share that with uh, external experts. So we have experts in the different fields that we uh, have programs in, and those experts then weigh in. So we have uh, experts that are more familiar or have been working on strategic leadership. They weigh in on the strategic leadership component. We have uh, people leadership experts. They weigh in on the people leadership uh, component. So then they provide us their feedback, and then we then go back to our drafts, incorporate that feedback, and make further changes. Once we've done that, we're then ready for uh, an internal pilot. So what we've done uh, before launching any program at scale, so before, and that's throughout our entire uh, uh, journey uh, as an organization, and especially now in an online setting, what we've done is uh, always conduct an internal pilot before, um, before uh, delivering or, or launching something with external uh, participants. So the internal pilot usually consists of um, staff members within, the own within our own organization who are very keen to, to participate in, in, in the new programs that we're developing. So what we do in those internal pilots is actually test the full program. So we test whether the learning outcomes are being achieved, how useful the content is, the flow of the sessions, the clarity of the sessions. So in a sense, testing the entire participant journey from the moment they learn about the program till the end um, after completing uh, the program. Once we, we, we collect all of that feedback from uh, the internal pilot, we're then ready to, to go back, use the, the data that we've collected, analyze that data, improve, and then go back and incorporate those changes into the session plans, and again, uh, improving the content uh, that we had uh, prepared. That was in the design phase. So that was um, you know, what we've done in the testing uh, and, and in the design phase. So now let me talk about uh, testing and iteration in the delivery phase. So once we've piloted the program, incorporated the feedback, the next step is the actual delivery. So now we're ready to deliver the program with um, 
fee-paying uh, participants, version one of the program. Actually, before I, I get there, um, another key point that I forgot to mention is, as we're also piloting the program, one thing that we, that we did with our facilitators that was key is that a number of our facilitators were obviously very comfortable for um, in-person learning, but had, uh, had never facilitated in a digital context. So the, the internal pilot was actually very effective for us to uh, train our facilitators, give them the confidence that they can actually facilitate in an online setting. So the, the pilot was not only useful in terms of gathering feedback, in terms of how to improve the content itself, but also give an opportunity to, to train our facilitators and provide them feedback on what are the best methodologies to implement in an online uh, setting. Which then again brings us to, to the delivery phase. So V1 of the program is when we actually then, after doing the internal pilot, roll out the program to fee-paying external participants. Um, um, during that phase, then uh, numerous uh, feedback channels, which I will talk about uh, in an instant, but again, we use the data collected, which is both quantitative and qualitative from, um, from the delivery of the program, take back that data, bring it back to our team, analyze the data and see how we can further improve the program for a second version of, uh, of the program. Um, so essentially the, the key point that I want to drive here is that as you see, this is a continuous cycle. Um, we don't stop testing after the pilot. We don't stop testing and improving after version one. We don't stop testing and improving after version two. It's a continuous cycle where we're continuously taking feedback from our participants, taking feedback from our facilitators, using um, the data that we're collecting to continuously improve the experience that we're providing uh, to our students and uh, our participants. So let me give you a few quick uh, examples of some of the feedback, challenge, uh, feedback ch channels sorry, that we use both uh, in the pilots, but also as we're delivering the program at scale. So the first thing that we do is session observations from our product team members. So we have um, members of our team who actually sit in on, um, uh, on those in-person sessions, but now on those online sessions, sit in and observe the interactions between the students and the facilitators, and also actually sit in on the breakout activities to, to get a sense of uh, how the participants and how the students are experiencing um, the program. So one thing that, that we've actually changed based on those observations is the collaboration between the facilitators. Um, so we realized that uh, in an, in an in-person setting, it's much easier to have a facilitator, if you have a couple facilitators, for them to jump between one another and, and share the, se share the session. Um, it doesn't really affect uh, too much the, the flow of the session. We realized that in an online setting, if you have more than one facilitator and they're, they're constantly shifting between one another, it really, it leads to a breakdown in the flow and the clarity of the session. So one thing that we've observed and now we've uh, changed is that we usually uh, have one facilitator take care of one main section, then move on to, to the next facilitator to avoid that breakdown in flow and clarity. The second channel that we have is also facilitator interviews and debriefs. After every single session, we sit down with the facilitators, analyze the data and get their own perspective in terms of how they delivered the session, what they experienced as facilitators. One thing that we realized is, uh, actually Essie talked about that, was the communication of instructions. What we used to do, the facilitators used to provide all the instructions for the breakout activities on Zoom and um, send the participants to the breakout room, which led to a lot of confusion. Um, they, would, they would receive 10 different steps and they, they weren't sure, okay, what step do I need to start with? Uh, and so on. So what we decided, as Essie uh, mentioned, was to scaffold the instructions. So you would provide one or two instructions, do a breakout, bring them back to the main room, debrief, provide one or two other instructions, go back to the main, go back to the breakout room. So sort of a scaffolding process that really helps uh, focus on the main key points and uh, avoid uh, uh, a breakdown in, in the flow and clarity of the sessions. We also then, uh, another feedback channel is participant evaluation uh, surveys and interviews. Again, uh, that Essie that briefly touched on. So we, at the end of every session, we leave about five to 10 minutes for the participants to fill out an evaluation, a comprehensive evaluation form for us. Um, and we usually have an over 90% of uh, completion on those evaluation forms, which really gives us um, really strong data in terms of how we can improve the session for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the students. So 
So things that we've improved is the timing of the sessions, how to break down the different activities, but also a key part is finding the optimal facilitator to participant ratio. We realize that in an in-person setting, uh, to have an adequate and optimal uh, ratio, you probably want one facilitator to about 10 or 15 participants. In a digital setting, you can actually go beyond that. And, and we realize that the optimal number is probably one facilitator to 20 or 25 participants. And that gives the, uh, uh, the participants and the facilitators uh, the, the adequate space uh, in terms of support that the, that the participants need in breakout activities, but also uh, when they have questions. And then finally, the, the final feedback channel that we have is uh, an, an asynchronous engagement tracker. So um, we have a number of activities that we provide to, uh, to the participants in between the sessions. So obviously you cannot cover everything in two or three hours online. And there's a lot of uh, those activities and challenges that we encourage them to take on. And as Andrew was mentioning, implement those challenges and those activities in their work setting. So that tracker allowed us to figure out what percentage of our participants were actually engaging and completing the activities outside of the online session, and also how many hours they were spending on those activities. And we realized that um, at times, some of the workload that we were assigning to them was, was probably too much based on their other commitments, especially for our mid-career professionals. So that tracker allowed us to really then adjust the workload and find the optimal amount of activities that we can assign to them outside of the online session. So again, the key point that I wanted to bring down um, here was um, this, this whole testing and iteration process is really a, a continuous process. Um, there's, there's no point in time uh, that we actually stop. Even when we've launched a program at scale, we have hundreds and hundreds of participants we're still testing, we're still collecting feedback, and there's always, there's always a way to, to, to improve what we're delivering uh, for, for our participants and improve their experience uh, and their journey in our programs. Um, so just a quick uh, question for everyone on the line. Uh, I'm curious to, to hear, so please type on the chat, and Tina, if you could jump in and, and let me know what people are typing, that would be great. So I'm curious to hear, how would you finish this sentence? So practice makes... I can see a lot of our participants answering perfect. The commonly used sentence, practice makes perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. Practice um, makes I'm sure permanent you... and improvement. Awesome, so we do okay. We do have someone mentioning yes. permanent. Great. I think, as Kina mentioned, most people would tend to answer this with practice makes perfect. Uh, but uh, in our case, so this is from a, a book from Daniel Schwartz from the ABCs of How We Learn, uh, where he actually states that practice makes permanent and practice with feedback makes perfect. So obviously, again, incorporating the feedback in the process continuously will then lead to perfection in terms of what you're delivering uh, for your participants and um, to your learners. Um, before ending and, 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 and moving on to the q and I wanted to give a couple of brief examples of, again, experiential learning um, in our organization. Uh, SE started talking about uh, briefly about that. Um, one thing that we do is so experiential learning in the digital classroom. Um, uh, one thing that we do is uh, coaching sessions for our, um, for our managers. So we help our managers become better coaches. So we do a simulation through Zoom where uh, we usually have three to four participants together. You have one participant acting as the coach. You have another, participants being, another participant sorry, being coached or they're the mentee or the coachee. And you usually have one or two other participants who act as observers to the session and provide feedback to the coach. So that's one way that we really immerse the participants in a, a real life scenario where they're able to learn from one another practice actually how to coach and then receive live uh, feedback from other participants who are watching them deliver the coaching sessions and really help them improve their ability as managers to coach others. So that's one way that uh, we implement experiential learning in our digital um, classroom. Uh, and then a second example of how we do that outside of the digital classroom. So I did mention to you that we have a series of challenges and activities that we ask our participants to do between the online sessions. One thing that they do is a time audit. So um, 
we, we asked the participants to go back, look at the last seven days, uh, the, uh, and, and to go back and do an audit of their time, literally putting down um, you know, every activity that they've done and how many hours they've spent on those activities. Uh, that allows them to really see whether or not um, they're actually spending their time uh, in the way that they think they are or in the way that they actually want to be spending their time. So by doing an audit of their time, they're able to know what are some of the areas that I'm spending too much time on that I should not be spending time on and what are some of the areas that uh, I'm not spending enough time on and I should really uh, uh, focus on. So, so this kind of audit that, that they do, um, um, really immersing themselves again, looking at how they spend their time, track their time, and then change their behaviors, uh, allows them to then um, meet their personal, but also their professional goals um, um, that they may have set for themselves. So that's, that's uh, another brief example of how we do uh, experiential learning outside of uh, the digital classroom. Um, I think we have a few minutes now for a Q&A. So uh, I guess, Kina, you'll, you'll guide us through that. Yes, Kavi. At this point, we would like to invite our participants, our Zoom participants, as well as our FD Live viewers to please type in your questions for our Zoom participants. Kindly make use of the Q&A tab. And for our FD Live viewers, you can type in your questions through the comment part. Okay, so if our speakers, Andrew, Essie, and Kavi, are ready to answer our first question from Benedict Ayonon. A lot of companies have workforce with multiple generations. How do you address generational differences in online learning sessions in terms of technological capacity and attention span? Right. I think I can I can take a, a stab at this, and then um, guys, you can also jump in. Um, what we've done with with Excel Online specifically is we've had um, sessions before the actual session where we we invite people. It's completely optional. If you have issues with the tech, uh, you should come in and go through some of the activities that we'll be using the tech for. So we, we explain um, in our webinar before the session that these are the tech, um, that we, the tech tools that we'll be using in the session. Um, if you are not comfortable with any of the tech tools, sign up for a web, um, a web help session. Then we have a separate session that is completely optional that people come into and, and can learn how to do some of the things that we'll be expecting them to do during the session. So like using Google Docs, um, being able to use the participant buttons in Zoom, things like that, just to get them a little bit more comfortable with, with the, um, the program and how it will be run. Guys? And I guess, Essie, making our virtual sessions very engaging is the key. So that participants from different generations will be able to enjoy the learning experience. Okay, and now moving. Uh, yes, and just maybe yeah, just to add a quick point as well. Definitely, the, those those uh, preparation sessions that SE has mentioned. What we also have is uh, we have a tech associate uh, um, always present during the online session. So um, you know, if if the participants at any point encounter any tech related issues or they're having problems logging in or filling out a specific survey or activity. We have our tech associate who is fully dedicated to ensuring that the entire session online uh, goes smoothly so that the facilitators on one side, the, the facilitators can focus on the learning outcomes. So their, their goal is really just to go on with, with the flow of the sessions. But if people are having tech issues at the same time, um, the tech associate is the one to step in and, and the one to, to on the side to help those specific participants without disturbing the rest of the group and without disturbing uh, the facilitators. So having that additional role that we now have in a digital setting that we did not have in an in-person setting is a, is a new role that we added uh, to help support our facilitators and provide tech support to our students. Thank you, Kavi. And just to, to add to the earlier question, Ms. Maribel Aglipa, I would like to know how should we motivate participants to complete the asynchronous learning? And Ms. Milaline Habeliana is also curious if 
how long should it take for the iteration design process? Gabby, would you like to answer or Andrew? Yes, Andrew. Um, I get. I can. I can answer the one about the um, motivating participants. Um, I think it it all relates back to the like the mission, not majors statement that we had earlier on. In that, you know, this this should be something that our learners want to learn and want to find out themselves. Um, so they're self motivated to kind of to they're self motivated to to discover what what they what they need to to know to to achieve their mission in life. Um, so, I mean, you know, with, with that in mind, you know, knowing that, you know, you can't always have something that's directly related to their mission. It's, it's about making it, making it as kind of fun and engaging as possible. And like having the, having the element of um, peer learning as well in that, like, so you feel that kind of social pressure to, to have something finished as, as much as everybody else does. Um, yeah. And I think, I think it also relies on the, we also rely on the fact that we don't make things critical. Um, so if you don't do something asynchronously then it's not absolutely critical you know you're not going to completely lose out um like it is it is it will really really help you but um it is not something that's going to that's going to completely disrupt the learning so i think it's a combination of those three, three three things um and then with the with the design process i mean yeah design design is never done like if you if, if you if you ask me like the design is never done so it's like um I think I can't. Remember. I think it was I think it was Essie who said earlier on that like you know the the minute we see something that isn't working in and throughout the course of um of one of our sessions, then we like then we go and change it. You know you know we're we're fairly bold at doing that. That like you know if something if something doesn't work, great, just change it. You know we've we've got other ideas, we've got other things to try out, and this isn't you know the, you know nobody gets too invested in an, in an idea. Um, so how long does it take? It's like you know how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it never finishes. Thank you, Andrew. I guess we can still accommodate a few questions from Eugenia Banta. One important factor we should consider in the training design is to work around how the participants will have a fun experience while learning. How do you think can we incorporate fun in virtual experiential learning? I can jump in because I'm all about making it fun. Um, I think some of our design sessions have gone where I, I go like, oh, let's play a game. <laughs> and people are like, really? Yes. We, so we, we look at all the ways that um, uh, people will engage with the material. And it's not always just listening to a facilitator. Actually, most of our sessions don't involve listening to a facilitator for more than 10 or 15 minutes. It's mostly our participants doing something, taking active part in the session and actually taking the the um the learning away from from one of our activities so for example we've had activities like a virtual scavenger hunt where people are supposed to look for for stuff but in the process learning how to communicate with each other even though they are not in the the, the same um, location so that was the learning we're trying to impart so most of our activities are made with the idea that people should be having fun while they are learning um, and, and that's uh, like the, I feel like that's mostly the ethos of, of how we do training in AL. Um, I think what, uh, one of our colleagues said it, said, said it best. He says, we create kindergarten for, for middle managers. And I think that's, that's what, what the whole process is, is about. So um, Kavi, Andrew, you can jump in. But I think for us, that is the main, main factor of, of how we design our learning experiences. Thank you, SC. We have more questions, but we are almost, we have almost come to the end of this webinar. I'll be reading the last question, which is addressed to Kavi. Our attendee says that he or she appreciates the idea on time audit. May you please expound on it about like the appropriate time of sending that to participants or learners? Kavi? Um, sure, yeah. So the, the time audit is, is something that we actually introduce in the online session. So the facilitators introduce the idea of the time audit in the session. And we also have some uh, accompanying resources and Loom videos that we actually do that we send them um, to, to, to understand a bit more uh, 
why they're doing the audit and, and the different components of the audit. What we also do is send them a template that we've prepared for them. So th that screenshot that I had was from uh, one of our uh, earlier drafts of that template uh, that we provide to the participants. They then, uh, by looking at the instructions that we sent to them separately and then having the template, they go about um, uh, tracking their time, inserting the different uh, hours that they're spending on different activities. And it's actually something that we ask them to do throughout their journey uh, in our program. So our Excel uh, online program lasts uh, for six months. So we're actually asking them throughout the entire six months, if possible, you know, drop 15 minutes on your calendar on a weekly basis, find 15 minutes at the end of your week, look back at your week and then track, you know, uh, how you've spent your time in those different uh, areas, in those different activities, which will then give you a better idea through that pie chart, you know, um, if I'm spending too much time um, on social media and not enough time on, on key <laughs> aspects that I would like to focus on, that gives you a much better idea at that point. But it's, 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 a, it's a continuous habit that we try to uh, have the participants to implement throughout their learning journey. At this point, we would like to request Andrew for your final words for our 321 participants and we have 82 still FB live viewers who are joining us this afternoon. For the, by the way, for those who will, who, whose questions weren't answered at this moment, we shall be taking note of your questions and we'll be sending those questions to our speakers so that we can respond to your questions through email. Andrew? Yeah, just, um, yeah. So thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for letting us speak today. Uh, I certainly really enjoyed it and I've loved your questions as well. Um, yeah, I think my, my main point is that, like, you know, the mission is not major, is that, like, Getting, getting people to learn it's like it's it, it's a lot through like self-motivation um, and having having your having your participants or learners have that mission will really will really help a lot and it does that it doesn't matter on the medium then about how it's how it's delivered um, but yeah if you yeah any any questions further for me um, yeah please reach out to the uh, PSTD. Thank you in behalf of PSTD, we would like to extend our gratitude to Andrew, Essie, and Kavi for sharing with us this afternoon your, your experience in, in how to overcome our challenges in doing this online trainings, this online virtual classrooms. And yes, the key here is really to provide our participants more, more opportunities to learn and testing. Guys, testing, design, testing, pilot testing, and redesigning are very important for effective virtual sessions. At this, at this point, we would like to turn you over to Lo for a few announcements. Thank you so much, Kina. So let me just pull this up right. Okay, so thanks again, Kina, and thanks also to, to Andrew, to Essie, and to Kavi for sharing with us how you were able to tackle all those challenges that came your way. I'm sure the more than 450 learners that joined us this afternoon learned a lot from this session. So just for a minute, let me share my takeaway. Uh, for me, it's that moving learning from the traditional on-site face-to-face modality to online and digital not only require commitment on the part of talent developers, but also a clear mission as shared to us by Andrew, creativity and taking risks to rethink what's comfortable for us as shared by Essie, and the right iterative structure to continuously improve our approach as shared by, by Kavi. So that was very comprehensive, but actionable at the same time. And again, I would like to thank uh, Andrew, Essie, and Kavi for spending an hour of your time to share these with us. Thanks also to my partner this afternoon, Kina, for wonderfully moderating the questions and the insights of our audience this afternoon. All right. So 
once again, thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon, to our speakers and to our professional team for arranging this webinar. Once again, my name is Lawrence Ko from the Philippine Society for Talent Development, and I look forward to seeing you in our upcoming learning sessions. Good afternoon.